and you have to look a certain way, wear a certain style of clothing, speak in a certain way. Um, and I felt it was not the American dream that you were told on TV. Every single person who either graduates undergrad or goes out of business school to uh, banking, they'll always feel the, the weight of the world is on them. The first mistake they make, someone might get mad at them. They'll feel, oh, this is a billion dollar ki deal hai ye, abhi kya ho jayega? And he said, you know, don't worry, you're not a doctor, nobody's gonna die. <laughs> I didn't get a holiday for the first six months. I worked every day. Weekend ho, Christmas ho, kuch bhi ho, I was working. And I'm in general very skeptical of quote unquote brand names, right? Like, okay, you have you went to IIM, so what? Or if you went to Wharton, or what, what does it mean? Finally, you know, you could be, it's like an athlete, you could be from Ranchi or you could be from Delhi or Bangalore. As long, if you play well, you play well. There are clues to a mosaic, right? You see, numbers are not by themselves, don't mean anything. The interpretation matters, the story you're telling matters, what they say matters, what is hidden matters. Who I think is an amazing filmmaker, thought of an idea and certain problems that he wants to talk about, they may resonate with people in 2007, but by 2009, people may not care. But it takes him that much time because he has to put in that effort, right? To give you something world-class and also some of it might be uh, execution related. He's making donkey. Maybe he doesn't get Shahrukh's dates, then what happens? It gets pushed by six months, right? And that six months can cost you in terms of the audience's, the customer preferences change. In this episode of Conversations Cafe podcast, we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Anirudh Pandita, who is the co-founder of Pocket Aces and Loco. Anirudh talks about how he fled from the valley during the tumultuous times, how he took refuge in Delhi, how his life shaped up, how he went to Kuwait and US for further studies and how he studied from one of the best B schools in the world uh, and how his life was shaped around the world of finance. He talks about his IB days, he talks about uh, meeting Warren Buffett and, and he talks about how he decided to come back to India to create content. We spoke in detail about the content business in India how does a content platform make money? How can you become part of the content space in India? How gaming is going to be the next big thing in the world of digital content and much, much more in this podcast. So if you are somebody who belongs to the world of marketing and content, this podcast is definitely going to help you find some value for sure. If you're liking these podcasts, do hit the like button that helps us with the YouTube algorithm. Share this video with people and subscribe to this particular channel. The podcast with Anirudh Pandita starts in three, two, one. All right, Anirudh, thank you very much for joining us here in this bright sunny day in Bombay, which is a rarity uh, around this time. And uh, I've heard that uh, you came back from Abu Dhabi recently and then you, you are in Bombay for uh, some time now. And thank you very much for joining us for this particular podcast. Anirudh, uh, have you always been traveling all your life? Because as far as I know, your uh, you know early studies, a graduation and master's, all of this happened abroad. Was it like that for you? Well, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here, to meet all of you, uh, those behind the camera and in front of the camera as well. Um, I was not much of a traveler actually. So it's not, traveling doesn't come naturally to me. It happened to me. Right. So um, being brought up and born in Kashmir because of the trouble there, hmm. had to leave. So then after that, as opportunity came for my family and me, and then we moved. And so, you know, grew up in Kashmir, then in Delhi, then in Kuwait. Um, from there, I went to study abroad. Uh, did my undergrad at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champagne. And that's, you know, that's when I went abroad. And then after that, uh, jaan visa mila mara, nahi mila to kahi aur chala gaya. And then came to the one country that doesn't ask me for visas. That's where I started my company. If you don't mind me prodding into a little bit into it, what was that time in Kashmir like? When you were growing up, how difficult was it for you as a child? What did you see that, you know, probably you have carried all your life? Yeah, it was very difficult, right? To see that whatever you took for granted, um, simple things like, you know, playing outside, meeting your neighbors, all that gets disrupted. Um, houses that you have, you have to leave behind. And I think the situation is, Terrible because not only were 
the people who left impacted, people who remained also got impacted. Right? So I think no, nobody is left untouched by it. And I think the, the great scar remains. I think that there is a lot of pain uh, that multiple people have suffered, not only at the level of, you know, an emotional level, but also at the physical level, people have been harmed. Uh, wealth has been destroyed and so there's there's a lot of different kinds of hurt that came out from there. But as a kid, I think the biggest thing was when I was younger, you were a bit scared, you were worried, um, you had to change because things were changing in front of you. You saw a lot of misery around you, which you, you know, cannot forget. Yeah. Uh, so you don't take some things for granted, but it also gives you a certain sense of toughness. And I think and not toughness like that you're a very big macho person or whatever, mm. it gives you uh, you know, you value every day, yeah. uh, you value opportunity and you make opportunities happen. Uh, you don't give up easily because we've also seen how to recover from that, mm -hmm. you know, problem. So today when we look at my community, you know, lots of people, they've done very well. And so that also shows resilience. Right. Right? So um, all of those things came up as, we, uh, you know, we grew up. Um, there was a sense of loss of culture, loss of identity, loss of land that, that was there. On the other hand, there was great pride in you know, where we come from, what we stand for. And so I think that's also kept me in good stead. And I think one of the great lessons from that was also a lesson in uh, being tolerant and essentially understanding other people. Okay. Because ultimately then we sort of situation hates, just begets hate. So I think it's important to move on and uh, be resilient in your mindset, but also not forget what has happened and, uh, you know, don't, not take that for granted either. Let's first talk about your U.S. journey, you know. Uh, you said that you went to Delhi and from Delhi you went to U.S. How did that shift happen? What were you doing in U.S.? Why did you decide that you want to go abroad and start studying? Yeah, actually when I was in Kuwait and I went to an Indian school in Kuwait, I went to Delhi public school in Kuwait and uh, the options were usually you'd go to India or you'd go to the U.S. Uh, some people went to Canada but broadly these were the two option sets and I actually got into IIT Delhi as well. But somewhere I felt that the US, and I had not been to the US ever before. Mm. So I didn't know what was there. Uh, but one thing I could see is that when you were studying, you could study many different things. And I didn't know for sure that, you know, it's just, I just want to do engineering or I just want to do, like, I actually just like math. So I felt that, okay, if I go to the US, I'll get a chance to try different things. Mm. And maybe I'll learn and see something else that I really resonate with. Um, and so that's that's about it. And then I chose a program that was great in engineering and I knew it had other good degrees also in the college. And yeah, that's it. I just went on a website, I saw the top schools and just applied to them. Right. Let, let's talk about what you did not like uh, about the first job that you took up, right? What was that one thing that you did not like? You thought that probably this is going to change your life, but uh, you know, it didn't. Yeah, actually the first job I got was as a teaching assistant mm. and actually I thought that was actually a fun job and I was a bit more relaxed than other TAs I made things easier and I think I'm hopefully at least that's the review I got was that a lot of people learned better in that class because I created an environment which was easier for people to learn in. and I think that so I actually really enjoyed my first job it just didn't pay very much but it was fun and it, you also learn how little you know when you teach something, then you realize the limits of your own knowledge. Um, in terms of the first full-time job, um, I interned um, in investment banking, then I worked full-time in banking. I think the one thing that I you know, did not enjoy was there was a very inward-looking you know, mentality in, in that particular organization, which is you know, only America, only inside America, certain regions, certain quantities, and you were boxed in there. And you have to look a certain way, wear a certain style of clothing, speak in a certain way. Um, and I felt it was not the American dream that you were told on TV. Because you were going there to have different experiences. That's exactly what we were point was. Yeah, I mean, there was, I didn't get a sense that it was just based on, okay, this is my, the work I'm doing, that's enough, right? So there was a bit of stereo, you know, stereotypes that were attached to you, so on and so forth. When I went full time in New York, that, that changed a lot. New York, I felt, was a place with organizations I worked with there. There was a lot of merit-based culture. The harder you worked, the better output you gave. It really carried you far. People were much more open-minded about other cultures. Yeah. Um, they were also very, I'm a very poor judge of character. So they were very 
open with the way they felt. So I didn't have to ever decode that what is this person feeling. The Midwest people are a little more polite, which a lot of people like, obviously. But for people like me, I just need to be told, right? You know, you know, if they feel good about it or they feel bad or they want me to, you know, F off, that's fine. I'm happy to hear that feedback rather than try and decode it from five different places. So I like that about New York and I realized that this is the kind of environment I want to be in. And that I've carried with me through the rest of my life. Like I, I think it's important to be upfront um, and be an organization which provides um, a merit-based culture. Um, and that's why in, in Rocket Races and at Loco, we always say that we operate as a sports team. And I learned a lot in my first full-time job. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the business school veterans, Ashwat Damodaran from NYU, actually taught us all our coursework in the first job. And uh, I remember a few things that he said, which have stayed with me throughout. One thing he said is, if you have the choice between being good and being lucky, always choose to be lucky, which I have seen throughout my life, right? And you have to create that luck a little bit in the sense that you can either manifest it or you can be in places where luck may hit you, right? So I think that's important and having that ability or the desire to take those chances, right? Um, I think that's important. Um, and then he also said that at the end of the day, no matter how hard things get in investment banking, right? And every single person who either graduates undergrad or goes out of business school to uh, banking, they'll always feel the, the weight of the world is on them. The first mistake they make, someone might get mad at them. They'll feel, oh, there's a billion dollar ki deal hai ye, abhi kya ho jayega? And he said, you know, don't worry, you're not a doctor, nobody's gonna die, <laughs> right? So I think that's a good mentality to reduce pressure on yourself and say that, okay, I can fix it. Whatever happens, I can fix it. And you must have that mentality, I must fix it. And get the best product out there, but don't get debilitated by the fear of perfection in that sense. So, you know, I learned a lot that year and it was the biggest boom year. So, And I mean, what is the year we are talking about? 2006. Yeah. So, it was like, uh, call it the jazz age of investment banking. Before the storm was coming. Yeah, I mean, you could start seeing this uh, kind of the signs, early signs in 07. But 06 was, in, like, I, I didn't get a holiday for the first six months. I worked every day. Right. Weekend, ho, Christmas, ho, kuch bhi ho, I was working. And I remember the first holiday I got after six months, everyone hugged me. So it felt like as if I'm going away for some one week. I was going away for two days. So, but you know, you st I still have stayed friends with all those people. And um, it's like in, in six months, I learned maybe what other people learn in two, three, four years. So I was lucky that I got those that opportunity, that sort of start. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it stayed with me throughout. Correct me if I'm... Uh wrong but was it the Goldman stain that you were talking about or the Goldman stain happened after this? Goldman stain af happened right. after this was at Bank of America and right uh, so the, after the first experience in the uh, Bank of America in New York where you're working for six months straight without any holidays you moved to Goldman Sachs would you say that it was you being lucky or that you moved there or was it a conscious choice and you did that knowing very well that now I'm interested in finance and now I'm sure that this is something that I want to build my career. The thing that happened is that, just like I said, as, as Mr. Damodaran said, the, it's important to be lucky and good. And there's another story which is in uh, uh, in Charlie Wilson's War, where he says that the story of, the, I don't know if you know the story of the boy and the horse, yeah. where they say basically yeah. the boy gets a horse, right? And people are like, you're so lucky you got a horse. Yeah. Then he falls from the horse mm -hmm. and people are all foot's broken and you're so unlucky you got the horse. Mm -hmm. Then a war breaks out but his foot is broken. So people are like, you're so lucky that this horse broke your foot. Mm -hmm. People recontextualize and you know, luck is important. Um, but yeah, in my case also that happened, which is that I didn't get the US visa. I had to move from uh, New York to London with Bank of America. And I was like, oh no, like, I was like, I was like, I was like, Wolf of Wall Street. Right? Every person goes on those you know, you walk walk down Fifth Avenue or whatever, you start thinking of those things. And then I was like, oh, I'm now in, why am I now in London? Like, things are slower here, like it's not New York, right? Those things, and you're young, you're so small in your thinking or parochial in your thinking because the, your mind is only on that one thing that, oh, I want to be the best at this. And and I think my stint then in London really taught me, I learned a lot, there were the other cultures, you saw different kind of companies on a different sector. So that was actually a great student and funny enough, I've gone back to London many more times than I've gone back to New York after that. So I was there for a year, then I got a bunch of offers in private equity, I moved to Dubai, 
um, and people were like, you know, I moved in September 08 from Bank of America and then Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch. So people were like, you, you're so lucky, you knew there was a merger coming, mergers will lead to job losses. And I was like, no, I just didn't get visa here. And I came to this other place. This other place showed me there's another world. I should take chances. I took that chance. I showed up in Middle East. They were like, oh, Middle East is amazing. There's so much money. Like you chose it correctly. And then of course, the Dubai dead stand still happened, mm -hmm. right? Then people are like, no, no, you made a terrible choice. It's just such a small market, only few things. Again, I made great friends, amazing experiences, made investments, which honestly, I was like 23, 24, maybe. From there, I went to Goldman. And then people are like, you're at Goldman, you're the best. And you know, in Goldman, Dubai, it's a great office, some of the best people I worked with. You had a lot of senior guys from Goldman, New York coming in. So you really got experience with them, you got time with them, which you wouldn't get in New York, for example. Because New York, you're way down in the sort of uh, pyramid. Yeah, you're way down, you're more functionally working hard, but you're not getting a top level view of what's happening in the world. Whereas now in this stint, I worked with a lot of the senior guys, I presented to them, they worked, they gave us their perspective. You also saw they were human. Mm. In fact, I remember uh, one of the calls, uh, one of the really senior people. Uh, they were at, that time they used to have these congressional hearings, I don't know if you remember with the, which is happening to all the tech guys now, yeah. where you sit in front of the senators and they all yell at them. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the interesting thing is that you, you obviously get the camera's perspective. So this person was you know, one of the senior, most senior most guys, they said, but well, you never get my perspective. So people keep telling you, why are you squinting? And why? It's like, you there are like 25 cameras in front of me. And then I have to remember this number from some balance sheet. It's like, it's impossible. And a lot of the times the guys on the other end have done no work. They're just coming with a, obviously with a certain set agenda to, uh, you know, prove a point. So it was amazing to see that also humanizes these people, right? If I look back, to, should I say that it was luck? Yeah, 100% it was luck. Of course, I worked through each and every day of that, but yeah, I'm lucky there's a lot of people who don't get that opportunity. And now when I tell the story to people, they're like, wow, you made such great choices. You went here and there. And I said, no, every time I was making a choice, I felt I'm making, you know, I have no option. Right. And I, sometimes I felt I'm making a bad choice. I'm like, oh, look, my friends have so many better choices. right? But over time, I stopped thinking that way because I realized that, oh, matlab, aap akeli paida ho gaya, akeli mar ho gaya. Right. So ultimately, it's you are the hero of your own journey. So just enjoy your own journey. You don't. That's why I don't usually compare with other people. Even as a child, I didn't have that problem. Like I was that co competitive streak in me is more for myself. But and what I could do. Right. So this journey then really helped me with that as well. Right. Just like you know, everybody is not the same. They may have advantages, disadvantages that you don't know of. Um, and usually it's not one, like human brain wants to say, ah, one thing made this guy a star or one thing made this guy successful. It's not usually that, it's a bunch of different things coming together. Okay. Correct. Lovely. Uh, what was that time when you thought that uh, now probably is the right time for you to go do an MBA? Because uh, you've spent considerable amount of time, you were dealing with finance, uh, you knew how the world was working. There was a, there was a storm that already had hit. Uh, in, in the US market and probably you were also feeling the pinch sitting there in Goldman Sachs. So what exactly transpired into that uh, decision and that too from one of the top institutes uh, in, in the world? Yeah, I was very torn honestly. I was doing really well. So I was like, do I really need to do this? I'm going to take two years off. So obviously there's an opportunity cost. I already know a lot of things. People who graduate from business school then also just do the same job I'm doing anyway. Yeah. So what am I really getting? Um, I'm in general very skeptical of quote unquote brand names, right? Like, okay, you have you went to IIM, so what? Or if you went to Wharton, or, or, or what does it mean? Yeah. Finally, you know, you could be, it's like an athlete. You could be from Ranchi or you could be from Delhi or Bangalore. As long, if you play well, you play well, right? So somewhere there, I was torn. I didn't, I was confused also that whether I should go to business school or not. Um, my dad and my mom were keen that I go and get a graduate degree um, and get it from a really good institution because it will then complement my undergraduate education, which was in, uh, obviously in engineering. Although I'd done a minor in, in business there as well, but they wanted me to get a proper degree then, right? So which is, which, you know, was well thought out. You know, my parents were like, you know, later there are jobs that 
may require this. And honestly, I was not seeing that. Yeah. I was not. I was seeing the opposite. A lot of people were not hiring MBAs, right? So I was very torn. And I think the biggest factor for me was actually my boss at uh, Goldman, who is one of the most senior guys now in Goldman uh, in the US. Uh, he moved back, and he told me that, look, are you going to regret at 46 this particular decision that you're going to take, right? Which is now known more as the Bezos regret framework, right? And I think that stayed with me since. Um, even starting my company, like I thought about it that way, which is like, does it really matter if you make managing director at 44 or 42 or 39? Like, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference to you. Right. Commercially, like from a money perspective, unless you became, you know, MD at 25 or something, like, okay, then there's a 15 year run, there's sufficient time to compound. Two, three years, you know, it's not going to make any difference. Like, look at, even if you did, did like a simple analysis on cost of capital, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But you cannot undo that. You can't go back at 44 and then say, I mujhe wo degree karna chahiye tha. So, that he said, he said, you should go. He said, if you don't go now, you're never going to go. Because your opportunity cost only increases from here. Right? Um, so, that was a useful framework. I felt that, yeah, look, I'm young enough. I can go now. I can afford it and I, you know, I made a reasonable sum of money, so I could invest it. Um, you know, my parents were keen to do it, so they were happy to finance it as well. So, financing was that was not a worry, which is often a worry for a lot of people. Yeah. So I was because lucky. that's a lot of money we are talking about. What was your fees at that time? Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was something in the 60k dollar range per year. I don't remember actually, okay. but it was something like that. Uh, but then there's living expense, you know, and then in America, the business school also, there are activities you do which are even more expensive. So, you were talking about travel earlier. I didn't travel that much in business school, which I should have now. When I look back, I feel like I should have travel alone. Because those are experiences, then you don't get time to do it. You don't get the same company. You don't get open-minded people who are willing to share with you. I think there's a lot of lot to be said for that, those experiences. And, uh, you know, over time, you start valuing experiences more than assets and goods. Right? So, I think there is an additional expense for that. Good thing is in the US, uh, and I'm not so sure about India, but uh, in the US, the financing available for uh, a lot of these loans, etc. for uh, business school loans is very reasonable and they're long dated. So, you have time to pay it off. My uh, managing director at that time, his words have stayed true. Over time, the value of that experience has actually improved. I've become less you know, less confused and I usually tell people, if, especially if they're younger, that go. Even older people, I just tell them, go. If you have time, go. Like, it's not a problem. Right. In fact, one of the oldest people in in our class, when people used to say, Are, thoda buda hai ye. you know, all the desis would say, Are, thoda buda. <laughs> but actually, that guy has created one of the biggest enterprises to come out of our... Um, Who are we talking uh, about? We'll not name names, but, <laughs> but they, they've, they've created a very, very large company. It's a multi-billion dollar company today. So, you know, ultimately, that person's experience helped them to yeah. build what they're building. So, it didn't matter whether they were 31, 32 or whatever they were. It's also very young still. That value has played out well for me over time. Um, you know, the degree has opened doors for me. The network has really helped me at times. Um, sometimes it's just the experiences that other people are having, the difficulties they're facing. Um, you know, just having someone to talk to, that's also important. Um, so, it's really, really been uh, helpful from that perspective. And in your opinion, what probably is the biggest difference that you see uh, from a Wharton or any other uh, business school degree abroad to a business school degree in India? I think one big thing is that what I saw at least in the early years when we were building um, our company was that the stint that people had between uh, their undergrad and business school was too little. The coursework in business school um, makes more sense when you have a little more experience because you get much more out of it. Right. Right? Because, you know, if you're like 22 and you, you do a restructuring case, let's say, right? Companies going bankrupt or whatever, right? Like, we're in the kind of environment where things are going down, right? Uh, we're still not in 2008. And so, having that experience is good for me. But, you know, when things are going like this, and if you read it in a book, or in a coursework, and you've never experienced something like that, you'll be like, yeah, you should do these four things, which is good, but you don't have any emotional understanding of how difficult that is and how it will mess with your decision making. 
and you know that is a big problem because then you don't you're not really able to appreciate the case in the way or the situation in the way that it's supposed to be uh, done so i felt that was a big difference now it's not true for everyone different people have different experiences some people come with that maturity already but that i felt was one big difference um, and look morton doesn't have grades so i think there is a level of trust they're putting in you that you will have the experience you need to have paise bhi tere hain time bhi tera hai tu waste kar raha teri problem hai right so that part i think rather than like you know hey this is the curriculum and which a lot of other business school even in america have it so i think that's a unique thing and i think more business school should have it because ultimately what you do in your test and all is not a good great barometer i feel of where you're going to get yeah and i think the other thing which i think that we liked in business school uh, and i get a lot of like people laugh at me in, in my company also because i talk about things like the softer courses like negotiation etc right those courses are helpful because you know when you're like me you're like you done engineering so you build things or then you're a banker then you're like okay this is the model this is the numbers whatever right the appreciation for the softer things especially when you're younger is lower because you're providing inputs into things ki yaar valuation range hai ya yeah this is where something is trading or like this is information you're giving information and analyzing it but at a very simple level but then when you negotiate things how do you get someone over the line right those things are trickier and i think having that then experience some work experience where you've seen some of these deals where two people are yelling at each other you know some guy leaves the call like stuff like that you know that really helps and then these soft cases help you right like for example you know majority of businesses in india we always say india is a family business but family businesses are everywhere and you see that how do you negotiate with a family business right and often they have their pride and there's a lot to say for your family running something right so um you learn those things in business school to to see these different type of situations you learn certain playbooks so i think those things are are good i don't see them as much here i see more like a general things but i could you know i'm also not as in touch with the curriculum of some of these places um that that we're seeing today so anirudh ek baat batao like you were you were dealing with hedge funds you wanted to make a career there you were dealing in numbers day in and day out in sab ke beech mein how did ashwin put an idea in your head and then convince you to come back to india and work for a content production company it seems a little you know, ashwin what the... time se hi kar raha mere mind mein idea dalta rehta wo mera senior tha na college mein he was also my roommate so my first drink also he bought for me so he's put all ideas in my head over time uh, but you know he his story was unique like he was working in banking as well so he was actually following our model what a bunch of us were doing he had joined that model he was like okay doing it and i think then his attraction to the arts started getting him involved in the arts scene in new york and both him and i love movies so it's yeah. there's a common uh, love we had in fact i taken a film course in in school just out of like love for uh, for this and then he would just watch the movies with me so it was like we I mean, we lived together right so like uh there was this definitely the common love and then he had taken it forward and he had been involved and he was involved in a film festival etc so while i was there we would discuss these things and then he was saying yeah should i go what i should should i do and then i'll be like yeah go 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 and then you know then he took the step and he moved to india he worked in film studios here worked in reliance set up jungli so he used to keep sending me mm-hmm. things saying ye dekhiye acha project hai tu waise kya kar raha hai khali baitha business school mein right and then you read some script by uh, in fact i read many good scripts actually so then i was like ye to bahut achhi si cheez hai and then i felt that okay like why are they not doing better <laughs> like this is, seems like better content does kind of exist and you know he felt that you know he said look i can look after the creative side of things i've been working on that and he had put in the hard yards there uh, built a network of people um gone through the grind if you want to say it that way so um and then he's like you can do the business side and then of course when i didn't get my and then what happens i didn't get my us visa mm. so once that didn't happen then i was like okay i'm i have two options either i go back work in london or or dubai or something in banking or private equity or i try something new like and then i was a little emotional also that yeah like matlab this might be a sign from god right so like so that's when i came and i said okay and he said let's just come over and that idea was with me that i said let's try it when i'm 45 46 
am i going to uh, regret spending a summer in india meri jo salary wahi salary mujhe milne wali hai agar nahi hua 3 6 mahine mein to main wahi karne wala hu so i said theek hai main aa jata hu and we'll see how it is and i came to bombay and i didn't want to go to delhi i have a lot of family there uh, and they're very warm and affectionate people but they i'm sure they would have asked me ki yaar tune ye job kyun nahi ki or get married i was also in that age where you know you'd get married so i was like i better stay in uh, bombay where i don't i had no family here i had never been to bombay so i was like main aata hu and then i'll see kya chal raha hai and then i had a lot of friends here so i knew that from a social perspective i was very taken care of in that sense ki i need something and then yeah i just showed up here and then i spent a summer and him and i were trying to work on a movie together and i met all these film producers and so on and then then of course we were then in the game then we were working together and we realized that look uh, there is no perfect setup we have to set up that solution ourselves and you're also younger you're naive you have to be a little naive to start a company the numbers are always a language they're clues to a mosaic right you see numbers are not by themselves don't mean anything the interpretation matters the story you're telling matters what they say matters what is hidden matters um and being in that world of where i've seen you know a lot of startups today when i see some of the posts people are putting i mean if i show you an accounting shenanigan book there's a book which i feel everybody should read who has interested in the hedge fund world it's like for like it will be like like literally i can go in fact i had done it for one of the big startups in india but i was like ye log kya report kar rahe hain aur like literally it's a case study right so i was all with the numbers it's also important to tell the story and that's what you learn in banking and i think a lot of people miss that is that you know people used to be like mujhe bas ye deal pe kaam karna hai but pitches teach you a lot because pitches you're telling a story right you're describing a company what can go well for it what can go badly uh, how does it like if you're looking if you work in bankruptcies which i worked in a lot at that time how can value get recreated right because it shouldn't be like because you when you speak to those ceos who brought back companies you learn something that people don't give up correct right and having that's why chapter 11 in america is important people come back like marvel look at a great story it was bankrupt today every movie is going for what used to be you know not even their market value right so things can come back you have to know how to take off how to land the plane you these are playbooks yeah. and wherever you find themselves you you find yourself and you have to play apply different playbooks and you may not win right. of course like the result is never all, always in your hand there's luck involved there's execution risk but all of that banking taught me so it was not just that or, or a private equity taught me it's not all about just the numbers yeah. and how people make decisions so that is i think really important over time as we've raised money and gone through the cycles in in, in building whether it's raising money for uh film which we, you know we we didn't raise that much or whether is for our company whether uh, you know you learn how decisions get made on the other end because you were there you were there like the, you know when in 2008 there were all kinds of strange things that happened i would work be working on some billion dollar deal at the same time we would not be funding something which is a small amount of money right. other times like the best asset would get sold first because they want someone needs liquidity so you saw all sorts of weird things because when you were sitting from outside you're like to bevkuf aadmi hai isne kaise bech diya ye sabse acha asset isne sabse pehle bech diya kyun because he needs liquidity but you don't know that part doesn't get come across to you clearly right? right when you came in here you were the numbers guy you were definitely going to help punch and set things up from the uh, data from what the numbers were saying and we are talking about an interesting time in india in 2014 or when we are talking about the political history of the country as well and the kind of changes that were happening with that change overall right internet was getting democratized uh, content was getting democratized and you guys were at the right spot to make a dent so all of this together how did you figure out the commerce of the industry that you were getting into like like you know you very rightly mentioned the coming back at that time was amazing because you know growing up in india and then when i grew up in kuwait every summer i spent in delhi with my grandparents with my cousins and stuff so i always wondered like when i looked westwards or when i looked at some of the other places in the middle east things were getting built by indians mm. indians were ceos indians were you know the top scientists would be indian or doctors would be indian um and then we i came to you know landed in indira gandhi airport and then it would be terrible so i never understood it, to me it was like how come we can't do it at home it can't just be the money something is not right but that flipped completely when i came you know in 2013 2014 from then 
now in you know, almost 10 years later, today in India, all the airports are, at least the ones in the major uh, big cities, um, uh, even tier one, tier two cities are often better than any other airport. I mean, the new Bangalore airport is amazing. Um, the infrastructure is rapidly improving, right? So we saw those things happen. And then the digital infrastructure, of course, started improving much earlier than our actual physical infrastructure, right? So that opportunity was amazing. And when we started, we started, as, as I told you, very naively that we felt that the cultural context of um, Indian film and entertainment was lower than its economic output. Right? So to give you a sense, you go to any country, you'd see Raj Kapoor, they'll know, Dilip Saab, they'll know, they'll know uh, Shah Rukh Khan, right? Amitabh Bachchan. Everyone knows, like you go to, you go to the east, you go to the west, you know, north, south, sabko, sab jaga, kuch, kuch, sabko knowledge hai. So I'm like, they know our stars. Hey, stars are your biggest marketing pull, right, for the films. How come our film industry at that time, in 2013, 2014, was only making $2 billion? $1 billion in Hindi, $1 billion in uh, right. Tamil, Telugu, right? And the rest of the other languages. So, I felt there was a disconnect there. Um, I also felt like like our technicians who had met were bright. So, it was not like, we didn't come Like, people knew there was a certain finesse, there was a desire to also do something. So it felt there was a dis you felt a disconnect. There were writers you would meet who would be like, want to make good films. You would meet producers who wanted to make good films. So it was like this weird thing where it's like everybody seems to want to make it, yet we're not getting there. And that's what led to our first idea that hey, let's create a film studio which is not focused on India. So we'll only focus on the metros because if you go towards the mass cinema, then you have to do what you know, you see in the mass movies. Yeah. They are not stupid or they're not silly for making those movies. They know what they're doing, right? They're not, uh, you know, they're not unintelligent. Like that's what happens in this discourse. What I used to see is people used to call the other people unintelligent yeah. or silly. But it's actually not that. It's that the person who's making that is a different target audience in mind. And then from there, everything evolves, right? But if you were to sell abroad, then you may be able to do well. In the US, you can see it. If you see the US film industry, it was only domestic for a long time. Then they're like, oh, we have, we're tapped out. We've got to go abroad. And they've done it. And smaller countries have done it. Smaller centers have done it. Israel has done it. You know, you've seen some of the best formats come out from you know, there. You've seen uh, or content come out from there. You know, um, uh, you see Endemol, etc. I think it's Netherlands based. So I was like, chodi chodi country se aare to humari country mein to aai sakte hai. So that was the thinking that time. And this is naive in the sense that we felt we could change the world. And we felt, oh, looks looks broadly okay. But once you went into it, then you realize the problems, the day-to-day -day execution challenges. And then we quickly realized that we are anti-startup in the sense that our model was wrong. What is a startup model? Like you have this lean startup here as well. Um, you want to be fast, you want to iterate. Time is your biggest problem, right? So. Money just helps you increase your time. It's a puzzle you have to solve before that. And so, we felt the film is opposite of that. It's high fixed cost, slow to market, the ability to get feedback is low, and then it's very dependent on the storyteller and whether the timing is correct. Okay. So let's say if Raju Irani, who I think is an amazing filmmaker, thought of an idea and certain problems that he wants to talk about, they may resonate with people in 2007, but by 2009, people may not care. Right. But it takes him that much time because he has to put in that effort, right? To give you something world class. And also some of it might be uh, execution related. Uh, he's making donkey. Maybe he doesn't get Shah Rukh's dates. Then what happens? It gets pushed by six months, yeah. Yeah. right? And that six months can cost you in terms of the audience's, be the customer preferences change. How fast it's changing. Yeah, exactly. And you'll see the great guys, including uh, uh, Raju Irani, which I've seen when I've worked with him recently. The point is that film we felt was anti, that's why the innovation doesn't come. Because it's high fixed cost, slow, sl and therefore innovation becomes difficult. There's a lot of money involved. So even the people putting money don't want to take as much risk. And that's where the digital model came. Because then we were like, what else can we do now? We had raised money already. So we told our angel that, initially we told him, we'll return it to you if we don't come back with an idea. He said, no, no, you keep it. Do, do something great with it. Don't worry, this money is for innovation. And that's when we started looking around saying, okay, let's take a step back. What's changed around us? And then we saw people were watching stuff on their phone. 
and that time even the internet actually was not uh, was not cheap yeah so people were you know you from the moment you entered a building from the gatekeeper all the way to your house people everybody was watching on their phone niche jo baitha hota tha wo sd card laga ke kahin se recharge karke sorry you know load karke apne phone mein dal deta they used to be watching content you go up and then everybody would be watching on wifi right so then you learned that of course you're in a tier one city but if the internet got cheaper then things could get easier and and then with these um with with youtube and with uh, facebook you could go direct to consumer you don't have to wait and you can make short content which means your cost of delivery becomes low your speed becomes high you learn quickly and all sorts of questions that you may have in your mind can start changing yeah that's when we started with the with the pocket aces journey well and truly from a digital perspective and then we haven't looked back since right tvf is your contemporary anirudh they have also scaled the business right from the time when you guys were scaling they are oh, at a point where they are right now they are making shows and they have created successful ips for them as well they took the app route which you guys did not i want to know why that's one and secondly why do you think the app space is also oh, you know struggling to make ends meet in india yeah look we know the tvf tvf guys very well we've collaborated th- with them multiple times a lot of the guys there are very good friends there are people there who are now part of tvf who we knew yeah. prior to tvf so there is a lot of uh, respect we have for them um i think they've done recently especially they've refound that dna they made them really really click in the first place um so uh, you know personally also i really enjoy Uh, what they've been putting out recently so uh, they've done a great job when tvf play was coming out we did meet them the the reason we didn't take that out and that was a very natural thing for us to think about also is right like okay we we've had successful shows we have short form content let's put it on an app let's go behind a paywall what we felt at that time was you knew netflix was coming and netflix had contacted us already to start discussions and actually the way netflix also happened is that every year i used to write to netflix saying are you coming to india here's a show we made and they they would be nice enough to write back and say no and then one year you know we got connected again and they said yes please come over and then you know you we went to la and started discussing with them and this is before they have a local office and all that stuff right uh what we felt is if netflix comes in prime comes in disney's not going to be far behind they already had hulu in the us at what point does the balance sheet requirement become too high so we felt that is a big issue and there was not enough content yet in the market because we would struggle even uh, to be honest like we it was literally like people used to call us like tum dono yashraj aur dharma ki tarah do hi issue log shows banate hain kyunki baki log koi shows hi nahi banate the bahut kam log the to koi bhi writers aate the kehte ha main iske baad tvf ja raha hu tvf se main wapas aa raha hu yahan pe pocket races milne so we had this i kind of understood from that that it's very small like how do i put even co- if i come out with this i need to have a lot of content so you can't then rely only on originals right this is the problem you need to have a catalog of content so catalog of content needs money which positions your um, uh, you know your guys with balance sheets pretty well now having said that looking back then i didn't feel that we had the ability to raise you know 500 600 million dollars maybe <laughs> if you had that ability you could have taken that bet i also felt that a lot of the tech was not up to mark right up to the mark with not only with even the tvf play had problems they were at least better they had engineers some of the other guys in india some of the otts and all who we were just seeing their first tech products were awful not built by them directly they didn't have tech teams and i think this is where hot started then did a really good job of like changing that structure right and a lot of credit to them for what they did there i think cuz what they did within that larger umbrella is is very difficult to do in general that innovation is difficult to drive in fact in some of the other networks you can still see their apps are pretty horrible um so 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 to your point on why didn't we go that route we didn't go that route because we felt it was capitally very very intensive yeah. and look this is not like to, the numbers we saw in the last 2 3 years we've not seen in india before that time raising 3 5 10 million dollars is a lot and this we felt needed not 10 20 needed in hundreds of millions of dollars okay so that was like a big problem for us um 
didn't see that there was a tech uh, DNA in other people, uh, especially in other places here. So we knew that you would have to make that DNA, which means that you needed time. So you wouldn't hit the market. And you know, I you always use this line, which is that, will you get distribution before they get innovation? If they get innovation before you, then you're screwed. And you know, obviously the OTTs have come, right? They have innovated before something else emerged. So that was the first problem. Uh, in terms of your other question, which you asked about, ki apps, why do struggle? Kar rahi? Because they don't have unique value. And I think that is a big issue in India. You know, when you saw the TikTok clones, like what is it in their app that is helping them? It's just that TikTok isn't there. And then as soon as Reels came out, the product experience was better. Do storytelling around it that, okay, like people in certain areas won't watch it. And I haven't found that, to be honest. <laughs> my, uh, you know, my... Uh, driver also watches reels. So it's not like he's on some other platform. So I think that narrative is a narrative. And we've seen that a lot of that is now coming to the fore. I think the other thing is that we have to innovate on the business model. I think the OTTs have actually done a better job of that because they've taken their TV pricing and moved it to OTT. Yeah. Some of the other platforms have really struggled on how do I monetize? And I think that's a question we have to innovate on. Do you think that ad dollar shift is going to happen in the online gaming space where you are doubling down now? Yeah, see, with Loco, we are a game streaming platform. So we are sitting at the intersection of those two trends. I think when you, you're very much at where you were with digital video in 2018, 2017. You in 2025, 20, 27, you're not going to, by 2027, you're not going to ask anyone, hey, are you a gamer? Because yeah. everybody will be playing games. They may be playing everything from Candy Crush all the way to Fortnite or Valorant or something, or some role playing game. But there will be a mix, but everybody will be playing games. So, as a nation, we'll be gaming, right? So, that part is clear. And once consumer moves, attention moves, attention moves, advertising has to move. Right. Now, the problem is for advertisers, which I've heard them spell it out to me multiple times, is their first question would be, what's going on gaming? Mein? And then the problem for them is that, how do I advertise to this audience? Mm. So, some of their problems are, publishers, game publishers are not Indian. Getting to those guys is difficult. They have to go through some ad exchange, etc. They want custom service. See, the first few ad pro, uh, ad orders also always have to be custom. Yeah. And they have to be done. You have to handhold the client, and rightly so. You have to give them value, right? They are taking a bet on a new plat new um, uh, platform, new idea, and new idea. So that part is problematic. Second is that video ads and the kind of ad inventory that they know works well is not always integrated into games. So you're playing, let's say you're playing a battle royale game, suddenly there's a video ad, doesn't exist. Mm. Right? That is difficult. Candy Crush, etc. may have it. But for a lot of these longer formats, which is what is becoming more and more popular, that format doesn't work as well. There will be innovation on that also. Audio ads may work in that. There's different type solutions now, different solutions may come. So they're like, okay, this is a problem. Third is I have a long lead time. I'm a brand manager or a media planner. I need a campaign next month. But when I talk to the publisher, publisher is sitting in Japan, publisher is sitting in the US, char connection, one email reply will be How can you plan like that? Whereas much easier for me, I'll call my guy at Group M or whatever, I'll call my friend at Hotstar and boom, I'll be advertising, right? Or I'll go self-serve on YouTube and I'm, I'm advertising, right? So lead times are high. For those guys. So, ad formats, ad uh, go to time and go to market time is, is difficult. So, I think that is being solved by someone like Loco, right? So, with Loco, what happens is it's a game streaming platform where you get similar ads, you watch other people playing games. So, it's video, the advertising is what they know, it's nothing different, it's what you what you're doing in other places. But the audience and what they're doing is very diff something very different. The genre is different. The it's highly immersive in the sense that people are spending a lot of time on it. They're playing the games, they're watching other people play games. There's The community element is very high. Uh, UGC element is also there. So community interaction is also really high. Right. So that is a solution in our, in our mind or to this conundrum of why do how do I advertise in gaming? Because otherwise you would be stuck with just some basic advertising. Having said that, it's still early days, right? So we have to prove that out. And I think once we prove it out, there will be this is a very large opportunity. Let me tell you, I am the I'm one of the early users of Loco. I was sitting at home uh, <laughs> during the lockdown probably, and uh, 
you know, I was playing and I was very intrigued because I would win some cash, right? There will be two times when the entire game will start and then you will answer a few questions and then we'll try your luck as to how good you are in terms of earning some cash. You moved from that model. Look, is a completely different model now, right? As somebody who is an entrepreneur or looking into businesses, these are pivotal points in the businesses that we make, right? At what point you did that? Why did you think that the earlier model was uh, not going to be sustainable and how happy are you with this particular model that you're seeing today? Yeah, so with Loco, thank you firstly for being an early consumer. Uh, we've seen success in Loco in different forms in the different avatars. So the first avatar was obviously uh, the quiz format which you uh, uh, consumed and that was unbelievable for me as an entrepreneur walking into a, a, a bar or a restaurant at you know, dinner time and everybody in the restaurant is playing that, right? Yeah. Whereas in Delhi, Bangalore, small cities, villages, it became quite a mania for a while. So, but over time we saw that the winners, people who were winning were coming back. People who were losing over time then slowly, 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 slowly started churning, right? So, we felt that, okay, it's a good format as a base. We need to add things to it, which we did. We added different types of game shows, etc. on it. Then over time, we added... Uh, um, casual games also because what would happen is that it would be only going live twice a day right yeah. the rest of the time people were like what should I do right and from a business model perspective you need to have something to allow for that to happen right so either um, you know you charge uh, ad you charge advertise or you do subscription right yeah. and for advertising you need uh, a bunch of uh, content there so we added hyper casual games that really helped us actually through the day there would be a lot of engagement but then in 2019, we saw the rise of, you know, the mobile arcade games in India. We saw PUBG Mobile and Free Fire really break out in a big way. 100, 150 million plus monthly active users. And I was lucky because I worked at Pocket Aces and at Pocket Aces, I got to see all young people what they're doing at all times, right? So whether it was the rise of TikTok or whether it was the rise of PUBG Mobile, we saw it in, our, in front of our eyes because that's what people were doing. And then I love gaming as well. So I also started playing it. And then I was also like, got to play this. It's amazing. And that's when we realized that, okay, look, this format of content doesn't have a place where a community can exist. It doesn't have a place where the creators can really coexist and get access to different forms of monetization. We have advertisers who had been telling us, gaming, my kya karna hai. So we felt like a platform was needed there. And then from a perspective of content, we saw there was no content support from any other platform. Yeah. We also felt from a timing perspective, this was just the first game that's broken out. The number of creators is tiny. If I told you like at 2019, I think it was like on YouTube, there were thousands of people with channels over 1 million subscribers. Yeah. The number of gamers who had that was like three. Mm. And we felt that the gaming community itself would have maybe 500 to 1000 channels of them their own which would get that big and before that live content had not worked in fact facebook had launched live uh, with pocket aces yeah. and i actually had hosted a show on it which was like we were doing a watch along of the world cup or something so the problem was live and uh, you know quality is orthogonal right you basically if you go live and things don't go well you can't re-edit it mm. right so what does anyone talk about when they go live it's difficult but with gaming, there's always something to talk about. Yeah. And these games finally had the right mix of skill, strategy, and action to make it exciting enough for people to watch. So we felt that, okay, the content is right. It's early enough. You would rather be early than be late. Mm -hmm. And from Loco 1.0, as we call it, where with the quiz, live trivia quiz format, we knew how to do high concurrency streaming. Yeah. And we knew how to do it for India, where, you know, you have different sorts of problems where people don't have stable internet connection and so on and so forth. So we knew that we knew how to build the product. We knew how to make it popular. We knew that we were the we were content creators ourselves. So we knew the problems that other people were facing in the industry. So we knew we could help them. And so that's why we decided to launch. And then of course, 2020 happened and it really helped us from that perspective amongst all the terrible things that were happening. That was the one sort of silver lining for us was that the platform just kind of took off and 
we also learned how to work remotely that time and we built everything and since then we've not looked back lovely uh, you have raised a lot of money as well uh, to be precise 51 million dollars if i'm not wrong uh, with a lot of money like that there's a lot of responsibility that also comes to your shoulder there's vc money that you are spending how are you making sure that you are keeping your investors happy as well and you are creating engaging content on your platform as well so that your uh, players who are going to come back and be the people who are the backbone of your company still come and enjoy look i mean you're absolutely right raising any amount of money it could be 1 million dollars or 100 million dollars or billion dollars always you raise from someone right and whether it's a vc vc actually manages money for pension funds which might be your grandfather or my dad or you know different people right so actually in some ways it's very important that you do right by that money right some of our investors they manage money for foundation so there is that level of we understand that problem uh, and there is it's important that we respect that right and we treat the money with that respect uh, having said that there is also a responsibility on us to innovate and push the boundaries in the sector or the problem that we're tackling now in terms of keeping investors happy i personally feel that the best thing to do with your investors is be honest with them they are not your boss they are not your vendor they are not your client they are partners in your business right. so you must give them that level of respect and transparency and give them your best what you feel and this is an in, like life is an infinite game right we had pocket aces now we have loco i might have three other companies i can start in the future if i am not starting they may start a company in the future they may be my partners as a business partner there's many things that you will do together so you must treat them with respect and tell tell it like it is yeah and they will hopefully do the same to you right. and you should have then the wisdom of choosing what advice is reasonable you should also have the humility to learn that you might be wrong other than that then what speed to go at whether you crash and burn or whether you use it and become a you know take off those are outcomes and for me that is less important than tackling the problems and being cognizant of what you're doing right or wrong and adapting to the world right so for us that means the product has to be great that means there has to be um, the right level of engagement if you don't have that then you can't monetize anything yeah. so they'll never make money then right it has to be of strategic importance to people which i think the product that we're building is it's a strategically important asset in the gaming value chain a distribution platform like ours is always very important so from a strategic perspective it's important what is the monetization model that still needs to be proven out we have not had any success like you said in any of these platforms in india so i think that's a that's that burden of responsibilities on us to try and solve it and that's what we're doing i think in the next 6 months you're going to see a lot of products that we put out and we are hopeful that they will be successful i really like the honesty there you uh, know because i speak to a lot of uh, startup founders and sometimes i feel that they're not okay with accepting the failure that's happening or probably the answers that they don't have of the problems that they are currently dealing with and i think the first thing is to accept that these are the problems and we are working towards solving those problems is where the answers start or the solutions yeah, start i mean my one of my idols is again from the hedge fund world is ray dalio's pain plus reflection is progress so if you don't if you're feeling the pain the pain may come with an investor telling you this is wrong you're doing this wrong mostly it comes from you listening to the consumer because usually the investor is the last guy like he's usually not your target audience right investor ki pain actually angelist jaisa product solve karta hai ya some saas product mein solve karta hai that's actually is the consumer there in the that's why i'm saying investors actually like your partner so usually the feedback coming from them is a bit late so usually if you hear something and you feel that they're right you should work on it right away because you must be very late but consumers usually tell you very quickly so you must have an ear for the consumer to hear their pain and feel their pain because then you will design the solution for it and then yeah you reflect and you move on and of course you make mistakes you don't know right the answer is you don't know you have to find the answer. that's the discovery process it's like you're like a scientist right you go to the lab most days are terrible some days you discover something good and then it actually works and it keeps working and you are working for those days where you find the answers Then, then let's talk about how optimistic are you about the Indian gaming space? How optimistic are you about finding that sweet spot for you uh, to see, uh, you know, the monetization happening with your company? And how big do you think that can be in terms of the jobs that it can create uh, for the people? Look, I think the gaming sector is 
vital. That's the future of entertainment. In my view is the present of entertainment also. But from a money perspective and a revenue perspective, definitely the future for India. Globally, gaming revenues are bigger than movies, a bunch of other sectors, radio, etc. put together. Right? Big games are doing bigger box office than most um, films, right? So, that's not even a question anymore. Um, in fact, you're seeing the reverse movement happening now, where you see like Last of Us is a game that became yeah. a film. Uh, so, uh, sorry, became a show. Uh, so, from that perspective, I think I'm very hopeful and I think it's very important for India to invest in uh, creating both the talent infrastructure, digital infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure for gaming to bloom in the country because we have the right technicians do exist on the field, right? So, and gaming is one of those things that you can actually take it global. Right. You see today the Korean studios uh, on gaming or a Singaporean or Chinese studios are doing so well. They're able to sell their products globally. We should be able to do the same because we have that talent. So I think that that will happen. Uh, and I think the government is looking at it from that perspective. In my view, already after cricket, the biggest sport is a game. And that will likely be the case. And at some point, it may even take over from cricket because more immersive. You can meet your heroes. You can play with them. I couldn't do when I was a kid and loved cricket. So I think that aspect of it is great. And when you look at India, when you go towards smaller towns and people may not have the facilities that you have for entertainment in a big town. So that little phone becomes a gateway to the world. Yeah. And a lot of these games are not just one player experiences, they're multiplayer hangout spaces. So you learn a lot about the world, you hear from other people, that makes you a better person and gives you at least at the minimum some entertainment. So Anirudh, uh, we have come to the end of this particular conversation with us. It has been a wonderful uh, conversation in my opinion. You have touched on a lot of things. Very few quick questions that I want to ask you and sure. leave our audience with some thought. Some of the resources that you uh, generally refer to is something that I would like to know from you, whether it's podcasts, whether it's books, whether it's videos or the channels that you refer to that you can share with us. I love uh, Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. One of the best books written on working on startups. I think that's really, really a cool resource. Um, I also uh, like to read the Twitter handles of a lot of people and just see what their journey has been like. And like going back in time and seeing what they've written because that gives you a true window into their... As somebody who has oh, done his MBA, what is your final advice for students probably who are listening to this, uh, who probably are at the crossroads right now, who are probably also thinking like you, whether you need an MBA or not, especially at the time that we are living in today. Yeah, like I was saying, everyone's different. So listen to people's advice, but they cannot make that decision for you. Uh, it's suitable for many people, for other people, it's not the right time. For others, it may be precisely the right time. And there are many reasons you could go to business school. It can be a valuable experience. It can also be a meaningless experience. It depends on you. And so don't remove yourself from that equation by listening to Ki isne kya kiya, usne kya kiya. Like I said, it will not matter to you when you're the one who's going to go into that experience. So education in general is helpful. And know that you're getting an education. That's important. Learning is important. See what, what you will learn there. What will it add to you from a personality perspective, from your thinking perspective? That's about it. Other than that, I don't think, and don't overthink it. Like, you'll have another year next year to do, make that decision. But think that it's for you, you, it's not for anyone else. Lovely. On that note, Anirudh, thank you very much for joining us. I hope that you had uh, fun reminiscing about the kind of days that you have spent in your life as well. And thank you very much for giving the business insights uh, to us in this podcast. If you find uh, value in this content, do share this, uh, do tell us in the comments below. If you have any questions for Anirudh, then we'll make sure that we send a few of them. Uh, to him to answer. Uh, do like uh, and subscribe this particular uh, channel. If you know of any guests that you think we should be bringing here, sitting next to us, do tell us in the comments as well. And keep watching Conversations Cafe podcast. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.